listening to CLNS Media, powered by BetOnline.ag. Go to clnsmedia.com slash roll. Use our promo code CLNS50 for 50% off your first deposit. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Red Sox Beat podcast on CLNS Media, your leading online video and audio provider for Major League Baseball. I'm the host, Chris Cotillo from MassLive.com. I cover the Red Sox there, and this is episode 217. It's brought to you by BetOnline.ag the leading online sportsbook and CLNS's preferred online sportsbook. And this is your May 21st episode. We are joined uh, this time by Chandler Rome of the Houston Chronicle, who covers the Astros down there. The Red Sox obviously playing the Astros six out of 10 games this week. Just lost two out of three at Fenway. We'll be heading down to Minute Maid Park over the weekend. Chandler, thanks for coming on. I didn't know this was sponsored by a sportsbook. This is a, this is a great development. Yeah, so uh, that's our, our sponsor. So far, since I've been doing it, so uh, thanks to BetOnline.ag for doing for uh, sponsoring us, and you can sign up there. We'll have some more information around the twenty minute mark, as we're con- contractually obligated to. Um, but yeah, I mean, obviously, Red Sox Astros this week has been kind of a weird scheduling quirk, and I just wanted to get your thoughts to start on the series that was Red Sox. You know, lost the first two to Houston, uh, close game where Rick Porcello gets pulled. Um, or left in a little too long. Alex Cora takes the blame for it. Rick Porcello tried to take the blame. The Astros win. Then they come out with five runs before, you know, basically the second out of the first inning on Saturday, win that one. And the Red Sox battled back yesterday with a comeback win. Kind of your overall takeaways from uh, the series at Fenway Park that we both saw. Well, I thought it was kind of ironic that on Sunday, A.J. Hinch actually kind of did what Alex Cora did on Friday. A.J. Hinch kind of bemoaned leaving Framber Valdez and a left-hander to face Xander Bogarts, who ended up hitting the go-ahead RBI double in that game. Mm-hmm. So you had two managers that were that were managing this series in May that maybe didn't have the implications. I mean, it's a series in May. I mean, obviously, we're, we're 45 games into the season. Nothing truly matters yet. But these two managers certainly um, self-criticized themselves. It's not something we hear from A.J. Hinch very often. Not that he, Not that he's infallible and not that he doesn't take blame when it needed but very rarely does he say that in the media very rarely does he go on the record with that stuff so it was very interesting to hear AJ Hinch say that but I think for the entire series um, there were two really well played games and one game that kind of got away from Boston early right Um, I I thought Rick Porcello looked really really good and 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 I think it's important to note what the Astros came in what their offense was doing coming into Fenway Park granted they faced the Detroit Tigers for three days and I think any offense is is really well served to face the Detroit Tigers at any point of the year because that'll cure whatever is is ailing you. But the Astros came in just on an unbelievably torrid pace. They had, they they led the American League in just about every offensive category: slugging, OPS, home runs, just about everything coming into Fenway Park. And you know, while the offense probably didn't have the the pop and just the consistent up and down good at bats, what you saw is that they work these pitchers, and it's not just home runs it's not just doubles it's not just extra base hits you saw guys work from 0-2 counts and work full counts work quality plate appearances and you saw it from more guys than just George Springer Alex yep. Bregman Carlos Correa you saw Jake Marisnik in the nine hole have a good series mm-hmm. you saw before he got um Aledmus Diaz got pulled but you saw when he was replaced by Tony Kemp who had a nice little series you're seeing guys like Tyler White who a lot of Astros fans want off the roster right now. He had an extra base hit that really kind of set the tone in that in that Saturday game right. um, uh, in the first inning. So it, it's really contributions up and down the order from the Astros that are really kind of set this offense apart from last year. And I think it's also important to note that when you look at the pitching, Boston only scored eight runs the entire series, mm-hmm. and, Justin Verla- and Justin Verlander didn't pitch. Yep. Um, obviously, Garrett Cole through the first night – and then they started a rookie in Corbin Martin who made his second major league appearance on Saturday. And then on Sunday, they started Wade Miley, who veteran guy, but, but still nowhere near a, a Justin Verlander or a Garrett Cole sort of reputation. And when you're rolling out your third starter and when you're rolling out a rookie and you're rolling out the middle of your bullpen in both of those games and you can still hold the Red Sox offense to eight runs, uh, I, I think that's something that, – that's probably the biggest story for me was that – the Astros went in there. They didn't pitch Justin Verlander. They only pitched Ryan Presley one day. Um, they only, I think, they only pitched Roberto Osuna one day as well. And still, the, the Red Sox only score eight runs against them against the pitching that maybe not a lot of people talk about. That was probably the biggest indicator for me that this was a good series for the Astros. 
Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think the Red Sox have struggled against lefties. Wade Miley it gave him some trouble early yesterday. They started, you know, hitting him once once Chavis hit a home run. I feel like he's kind of gotten the floodgates open for this team in, in a lot of games recently, but that kind of turned things around and, and the Red Sox were able to get a win on a day where Chris Sale wasn't sharp. I think that was another big storyline, at least on our side of things in Boston, where Chris Sale walked five guys yesterday. He wasn't as sharp as he has been in his, you know, 17 strikeout appearance last time out against uh, the Rockies. So the Red Sox Expect to win on sale days. They didn't do it maybe in a traditional way yesterday, but they were able to, you know, get a win. And I think that's important. Something you referenced earlier, I thought was really interesting because something that I thought as well, and I think it's something that we'll see, you know, later this week in at Minute Maid Park, where these managers were kind of managing these games like they were bigger than they are. And I think for me, there's a couple things that go into that. One, they respect how good the opposition is. They obviously met up in October. Red Sox won that series in five. And then I think there's just that relationship between A.J. Hinch and Alex Cora, his former bench coach of the competitive fire, the relationship between you know a lot of guys um, on the Astros and Alex Cora that he wants to go out and beat them. So while he might say it's every win's a good one and you know the series is no bigger than the other, I think you know for me that this is one that he has circled on his calendar still, even a year removed from working there. And both guys, you know, maybe put a little bit more into this than uh, they would have any other series in May. Yeah, I think so, too. And, um, and Chris, you weren't in the, the interview room, obviously, with the Astros after the Sunday game. But that was about as as perturbed as we've seen A.J. Hinch after any. They haven't lost much this season, and he hasn't had much reason right. to be upset. But uh, Sunday was probably the most, the, the shortest and kind of the most, you know, visibly perturbed we've seen A.J. Hinch all year. So um, that was the game. And the one thing about A.J., A.J., A.J.'s not, he doesn't like to lose, obviously. I don't think any manager does, but. I, I, he really doesn't like to lose games that he feels his team should have won. Mm-hmm. And I think the way the Astros played Sunday, they, they played sloppy. I mean, Alex Bregman booted a ball in the first inning. They had two – you could debate whether they were catchable pop-ups on the right side of the infield that um, miscommunication between the right side of their infield, two backup infielders playing, and then um, you know the win was a problem. But it, it just wasn't a clean game, and that's what the Astros have been doing so well this year. They've been playing so crisp – um, mm-hmm. they, they had obviously won 10 games in a row coming in and, and it was just kind of a departure from what we've seen, the style of baseball they've been playing during the streak. And, and it obviously came back to get them and, it, and that's a one run game. And, and AJ Hinch is obviously going to put it on his shoulders. If he feels like he had Hector Rondon up in the bullpen, um, Xander Bogarts obviously does well against left-handed pitching from Bell does as a, is a rook. Uh, I, I, I think he's still got rookie status, mm-hmm. but he's not, he doesn't have much major league service time. Yeah. Hasn't pitched much in those big situations. And I think AJ kind of figured that, that game with the offense he has behind with the offense, he deploys out there. He figures that he doesn't want to mess up any opportunity they have to come back and win that game. And I think he felt like leaving Fromber in there was sort of um, kind of setting them up to fail. And he said he questioned it on the front end and he's always, he's always going to question it on the back end too. And it doesn't work out for him. So yeah. And, and, and the relationship with Cora, obviously how the, how the postseason ended last year. These are two teams that I don't want to say it's a rivalry, but it's maybe not in the rivalry in the way that, you know, we think of North Carolina Duke or Alabama Auburn. If you, mm-hmm. if you think of colleges, they don't hate each Good other. Good plug I there. Think, yeah. I, I don't think these two teams hate each other. I, I think there's a mutual respect for one another. So yeah. This is not Yankees, Red Sox. Mm-hmm. Uh, those, those two organizations, franchises, fan bases hate each other. I don't think that's the case here. I think both teams want to beat the other one. But I think there's a ton of mutual respect and a ton of mutual friendships on both sides. And, you know, I, and, I, and I think when you're with friends or when you're with people you like, you obviously you want to beat them. You want to do that sort of thing and you want to keep these one streaks going. But I think when you look at this rivalry, it's certainly developing and it's certainly budding in the last couple of years. But yeah. I don't think it's got bad blood in it at all. No, I don't think so. I think the closest kind of was that playful Bregman Instagram story where, you know, they all hit home runs off Ivaldi and that kind of became a big thing. Uh, right before Evaldi started and dominated in the ALCS. So, um, but other than that, I think that was more playful than anything. The Red Sox obviously went down and won three games in Houston. I think, you know, on the Red Sox side, that was, I think I've heard a lot of people say this, but the longest five game series of all time, it felt like seven, you know, and just kind of, even though they, they won all three games in Houston, it felt like that series was a lot longer than it was. The World Series felt kind of like more of a beating, but, you know, the way the ALCS went didn't. The Red Sox breeze pass went on, won the World Series, and kind of the focus shifted on keeping the core together. But um, after a lot of people expected the Astros to 
win that series, including myself at the time. You know, I think obviously it's a, it's a big disappointment. I just want to see from your end how the Astros kind of responded to that kind of in the days and weeks after and then you know, how they kind of formed their offseason if they did uh, after losing, you know, after winning the World Series the year before. I think it's very interesting. I think they're, along with the Yankees, obviously the primary competition for the Red Sox in the American League, and they made some changes uh, over the winter. And uh, how did they respond? To, to that loss, to losing you know four out of five games to, like you said, not an arch rival, but a team that you know, they respect and they really thought, and as a lot of people did, they could have beaten in October. Well, I think the first thing that the Astros will, or the first to point out, and I don't think they use this as an excuse. I think they use it as the truth is they were really banged up. Yeah. I mean, Jose Altuve was playing on one leg. Mm-hmm. Carlos Correa was playing through kind of unwisely playing through a lot of back problems that sort of derailed his entire second half. George Springer, though he won't admit it, he had a thumb sprain in August that he never really recovered from. And and if you look at the numbers before that thumb sprain happened and then after the power had gone away, he he was not as, he he didn't have his pop at the plate uh, after that. So those are three cornerstones of your lineup that that just, um, that, that were playing injured. And then Alex right. Bregman did not have a good series. Um, he was he was carrying that lineup when it was healthy all year. He, mm-hmm. Even when it was healthy, Bregman was the guy carrying that lineup. And then you'll remember, obviously, Charlie Morton goes out there, and he hadn't pitched in a month and a half. Yep. Uh, by the time the LCS rolls around, he barely gave him really – I think he gave him three or four innings in his start. and mm-hmm. They just – they weren't healthy. And, and I think that's – what they always want to remind everyone of, not that they're using it as an excuse. I think they were very deferential toward the Red Sox. And I think they were very, very complimentary. And I think AJ Hinch in the post game press conference right after game five, um, you know, gave them all, all due credit. And I mean, it was a, it was a yep. beating for, it was no matter how hurt they were, the, the Red Sox couldn't just roll the ball out there and expect to win. They still had to do it. Andrew mm-hmm. Benintendi had to make a great catch in game four. They yep. had to beat Justin Verlander in game five and they did it. And mm-hmm. that is and commendable to them. But I think as far as the offseason goes, they wanted to make sure they got these guys healthy. Yep. And it's kind of ironic. The Red Sox are going to roll in the Minute Maid Park this weekend, and the Astros are not very healthy. Um, George Springer left the game on, on Sunday with lower back stiffness. They don't think he's going to have to go on the disabled list. But we heard this with Carlos Correa for three weeks last year, that he kept battling back stiffness and they never wanted to put him on the DL. And and he kept trying to play through it, and it didn't go well. Jose Altuve is on the injured list right now with with a uh, with a with a hamstring strain. Aledis mm-hmm. Diaz, his backup, is on the is not on the injured list. He's on. He's got a strained hamstring. He's not playing tonight against the White Sox. So it, it's kind of ironic that the that the Red Sox are going to roll into Minute Maid Park while the Astros are again um, very injured. But as far as the offseason goes, they got these guys healthy. Um, Jose Altuve had surgery right after Game Five of the ALCS. I think the day after. He was on the operating table having surgery. Carlos Correa didn't have to have back surgery, but he did have surgery to correct a deviated septum, um, which if, you, if you've if you looked at guys in the past, Jed Lowry, I know, had this. A couple of other guys have had deviated septum surgeries, and they say that works wonders to kind of it, – it may not help with the on-field baseball stuff, but when you've got a, when you've got a, a septum problem like that, it, you can't really sleep much. You're snoring a lot. You're waking up in the middle of the night. I think Mike Napoli might have been another one of those guys. Right. So you don't get the rest that you really need. And Carlos Correa, though he he's done a lot of different things with his back, he's now got like a 45-minute post-game routine he does after every game with his back to make sure nothing goes awry. But I think he's talked about that deviated septum surgery playing more into his offseason and, and how he thought that could make him better, maybe even than the back did. Um, George Springer, the thumb is the thumb got better, but then you look at some of the stuff they did in the off season, they went out and, and kind of got one of their reclamation projects at starting pitcher and Wade Miley. He doesn't need to be made over maybe as much as Charlie Morton did, or, mm-hmm. or if you go back, even Colin McHugh, um, they don't really need to make him over. He's still throwing a ton of cutters. He's still getting a lot of soft contact on the ground. Um, dare I say he's kind of their Dallas Keuchel fill in uh they, they they made dallas keichel a qualifying offer keichel didn't accept it which now in hindsight looks kind of um not wise mm-hmm. um but they went out and got wade miley who maybe doesn't pitch exactly like keichel but he's left-hander he's crafty down in the zone he's not going to strike a lot of people out but he's going to get soft contact and he's going to 
he's going to eat innings for you. And that's what he's done. He's been this team's most consistent starting pitcher, not named Justin Verlander or Garrett Cole. Um, they went out and I think, um, obviously, the, the signing at the time wasn't really talked about much. But what, what has really shown through is Michael Brantley and just how he's been able to lengthen that lineup. I mentioned a little bit earlier that the, the difference between this offense and last year's offense is that after last year's offense, especially in the second half when they were hurt, once you got past the fourth or fifth hitter, six through nine in the order were, were I don't want to say easy outs because they're all majorly, these are majorly, this is majorly talent, but mm -hmm. they they did not present the challenge that this lineup does. I mean, there, there's some nights where Josh Reddick hits seventh in this lineup and Josh Reddick's leading the American League with a 333 batting average. Um, yeah. I think his turnaround has been something that's keyed this as well. They're getting production from every part of their order. They signed Robinson Chirinos, who... Um, at the time, again, that's not, uh, at the time of that signing, a lot of the beat writers sort of raise their eyebrows because for a team that values defense at the catching position, Robinson Trinos was one of statistically the worst defensive catchers in baseball last year. They got him because of his bat, and he's come in and he's uh, he's got a high 800s OPS right now, and he's pulling the ball a minute May Park. He plays well at the Crawford boxes, obviously with that pull side. Swing, he's spraying the ball around a little bit, and he's improved his defense. He's already caught four base stealers this year after catching six, a grand total of six all last year. Um, so he's providing pop at the bottom of that order. But the reason that they can hit those guys at the bottom of the order is because they stuck Michael Brantley in, in the cleanup spot, mm -hmm. and he has been everything that the Astros have envisioned and more. He's not striking out. He's, he's even got a little bit more pop maybe than I thought than I thought he would have, maybe that the Astros even thought he'd have to. He's already got 10 home runs. Um, he's got a 950 OPS. He's he's living up to every sort of expectation the Astros had for him. And what the, one thing that they're able to do is they're able to spread the DH around with him. Michael Brantley's got a, a long history of injuries, and that's probably why he, he didn't have more success in Cleveland was because he was hurt a lot. And so what A.J. Hinch is doing is he's able to spread the D.H. around, and Brantley's already D.H. seven times this year. George Springer's D.H. ten times. And part of that is not having production from Tyler White, who they thought would be their primary D.H., but part of it is A.J. Hinch likes to spread it around and give these guys kind of half days off. Mm -hmm. you know, Michael Brantley doesn't have to play the field for a game. He can get off his feet and just have four, four at-bats, four good plate appearances. Same thing with George Springer, who is kind of renowned for being this – in, in a in a non-contact sport, George Springer provides all the contact you need. He's running into walls, he's diving, yep. he's doing so they so they really need to manage him wisely. And I think AJ Hinch doing that, spreading around the DH has really helped. But uh, I think that in their offseason was the biggest goal was to lengthen this lineup and to get something from the bottom of the order. Because when you looked at their seven, eight, nine last year, their six, seven, eight, nine some days. They they weren't getting much of anything, and then when you got to the playoffs, those guys weren't producing. You, you had kind of the cornerstones of your lineup were hurt, and it really all contributed to an ALCS loss. Yeah, I think, you know, obviously the Astros were a lot more active than the Red Sox were over the winter. The Yankees were active as well. Uh, people in Boston, I think, see Wade Miley doing what he's doing, and Wade Miley was with the Red Sox in 2015. He had an ERA somewhere around 4 or 5 that year, and I think he's most remembered for getting into a big altercation with John Farrell in the dugout in Baltimore about being pulled. I don't remember the specifics because I wasn't on the beat then, but Wade Miley's kind of a not necessarily a, a revered figure uh, in these parts. So to see him come back yesterday and, and pitch pretty well and like he has all year was, was kind of funny. I think, uh, you know, the big storyline that we in Boston dealt with all winter was Evaldi and Kimbrell. Uh, Evaldi was a guy that was rumored to be going to Houston. It seemed like that never really took off. And then Kimbrell in a similar boat to Keuchel and, and not signing. So, you know, very different off seasons. The Red Sox go out and get one guy added to the 40 man roster and Colton Brewer, the Astros add a bunch of pieces. Uh, and now time for that promo read. I teased earlier, Craig Kimbrell, still a free agent like Dallas Keuchel is. And I think both of these teams realized that, in their own way, they could find a cheaper alternative for two guys that have been really important pieces of contenders in the last couple of years. The Red Sox with Craig Kimbrell have decided they're going to do this bullpen by committee that we've seen on display the last three days. You saw it. Brandon Workman gets his first save yesterday. We saw Brandon Workman pitch in the sixth inning of an 8-2 game today in Toronto. So, you know, from a very high leverage situation to a very low leverage situation, Matt Barnes is really 
kind of the leverage reliever. He comes in in all the big situations. Ryan Brazier's been up and down, and Marcus Walden's been a big surprise. But there's not that bona fide closer in Craig Kimbrell. You talked about Wade Miley kind of stepping in as a Dallas Keuchel light. So you see the similarities there between you know these teams. Uh, you're not a major leaguer channeler, and nobody probably listening to this show is, but that doesn't mean you can't get in on the action this spring. If you want to get in on the action, go to betonline.ag, CLNS Media's leading and preferred sports book. There's only one place to share on the wins with the Red Sox by grabbing the odds and allowing the experts to do the heavy lifting. They have sports, live betting, a virtual casino, everything you could possibly want. BetOnline.ag is CLNS Media's preferred sports book. If you're feeling lucky and would like to support our podcast, it's easy. You just go on CLNSmedia.com backslash SoxBeat, S-O-X-B-E-A-T, and use the promo code CLNS50 for a 50% sign-up bonus. That's CLNSmedia.com backslash SoxBeat, CLNS50, BetOnline.ag is your online sports book experts. So getting back to uh, the actual baseball talk here, looking at these guys, they gave them a qualifying offer. They said no, and they weren't going to break the bank. With the Astros and Keuchel, uh, do you think there's any chance of a reunion, number one? And then if not, where do you think he could possibly end up? Because this is a guy that you know, has a Cy Young, has been a solid major league starter for a while, and just like Kimbrell, still out there in, in mid-May. I mean, uh, until he signs somewhere, I, I guess I can never shut the door on a reunion. Mm-hmm. Um, I would be, I, I would be surprised. I, I don't, I don't think that's in the cards here. Uh, I think the Astros are were comfortable going with the qualifying offer that they extended him, and I don't think they're willing to go much over set that seventeen point nine million they were going to give him. Um, as far as where he ends up, I mean, I, I guess it all depends on when when the draft ends here in two or three weeks, and we look at what teams need. Um, yep. You look at the Padres, the Padres have kind of been out there and saying that they want to upgrade their rotation. I don't know if they view Dallas Keuchel as an upgrade in their rotation. I don't know if they'd want to wait till the trade deadline maybe to to partake in the Stroman or Bumgarner sweepstakes. Mm-hmm. Um, I've, I've thought from the beginning that, that, that maybe Atlanta made sense for, for Keuchel, um, a, a team that, that's going to have to be chasing the Phillies and maybe wants to get secure a wild card, maybe even win that division, maybe – pair him with a guy like Kevin Gosman and reunite him with Mike Fulton Avich, who was, a, was an Astros farmhand with Dallas Keuchel. They're close and friends. A- Atlanta makes a ton of sense for Kimbrel too. And they still haven't seemed to really jump in. So uh, not necessarily the aggressiveness I would have expected from them, but on both guys. And I, I, maybe we'll see it. Maybe we'll see it ratchet up when the drafts over when the compensation, mm-hmm. when the, when the draft picks no longer attached and, and these teams can really go after it. But um, I, I think we can both agree though, that both of these guys maybe have, whether it be them, whether it be their representation, whether it be um, just all around, I think they've 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 misplayed their hand um, this off season. That it's May twentieth and a Cy Young Award winner, and probably the one of the one of the two or three best relievers, active relievers in baseball, is not pitching for a team. So yeah. I think I think we can both kind of agree that they misplayed this 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 off season uh, pretty pretty poorly. And I thought what Dallas Keuchel did sitting down with Tim Brown of Yahoo and kind of going through, kind of going on the record for the first time about everything and saying he didn't set out to be a martyr for the players or, you know, the symbolic guy who's going to wait and get, you know, fight for what is right. I thought it was a really interesting take. It's something that Kimbrell has not done once. Kimbrell's not a guy that loved talking to the media when he was here. So it's not something I expected. But seeing Keuchel go out there and say, you know, there are some offers that my agent Scott Boris would have wanted me to accept. And I just didn't think that that was my value. I thought it was interesting to come out and say that and now uh, really be committed to trying to get a suitable deal. It obviously hasn't come yet for either of these guys though. Yeah. And, and Keuchel's not a guy that he's probably the antithesis of Kembrell as far as dealing with the media. He was, he was always pretty open, uh, mm-hmm. always pretty honest. I think a lot of Astros fans forget that he put the front office on blast in 2017 Yep. When they did nothing at the non waiver trade, well, they, they didn't do nothing. They acquired Francisco Liriano. Mm-hmm. But uh, they, after Close that, enough. they did ne- yeah, after that, they did next to nothing at, at the 2017 deadline. And he unprompted kind of unleashed a, a pretty pointed attack on the front office and owner. And, you know, a month and a half later, they had Justin Verlander. Right. So uh, I'm not saying that, that, that Dallas Keuchel going on the record and blowing up the front office was the impetus that the Astros needed to go acquire Justin Verlander, but it's 
those two things, they, I mean, they correlate. And right. I think a lot of Astros fans forget that. I think Dallas Keuchel as a whole, as an Astro, was really underappreciated. Um, there were a lot of fans at many junctures of last season and the season before that um, wanted Keuchel gone. And I, I could never figure out why because um, – He's not going to strike people out, obviously, and he's going to give up some hits, and he's going to give up some home runs, and he's just – he's not the kind of prototypical pitcher that we're used to seeing, especially now with Cole and Verlander fronting this rotation. But yep. this this was a guy that was – this was the first ace of the new era of the Astros. Um, he was a guy that got people to the ballpark in 2015 when this team was making a playoff push. They had a Keuchel's corner section in, the, in left field at Minute Maid Park every time he started. They would give out free beards and – and people would cheer on this crafty lefty who would get a bunch of soft contact ground ball outs and strike out like three dudes. Um, mm-hmm. He was he was the he and Jose Altuve were really the 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 keys and the faces of this renaissance and this rebuild of the Astros. And obviously Altuve is always going to get his due, but uh, I just feel like Dallas Keuchel really did go underappreciated here in Houston for what he did and sticking it out the way he did through some really lean years and he. he he provided some huge starts for this franchise and obviously he's not going to, he doesn't have the name allure of Justin Verlander. He doesn't have the stuff that Garrett Cole has, but he does a little bit differently, but he did it really effectively. And he's a guy that I think Astros fans owe a lot. They owe a lot of gratitude and, and he's a guy that should be welcome in Houston whenever he comes back, if he comes back, um, whether he's pitching for another team, whether down the road he ends up back pitching for Houston, he should be welcome back here. But I think that's really been all, all – that's really always been a thing with Keuchel is I've always been surprised how fans are quick to dismiss him and fans are quick to want, you know, kind of forget what he did for this franchise from, you know, about 2014 to the middle of 2016. Yeah, and I think there's some parallels to be made there with Kimbrel because Kimbrel, you know, was lights out. He was an all star, and every season he pitched for the Red Sox, and he's obviously going to go down as one of the greatest closers of all time. But last October, you know, you saw it. There was a lot of uh, he gave a lot of people heart attacks, and even referenced that tipping his pitches and and really a concern really throughout the postseason, not getting not having clean innings. He ended up, you know, I don't think he blew a save and ended up being okay. But it was a, a lot of concerning signs last year. He was not sharp in September leading up to the playoffs. And I think the Red Sox look at that as, you know, maybe reason not to give him the six year, $100 million deal or whatever he was asking for at the winter meetings. Not that anybody was going to give him that, obviously, because no one has. But Red Sox fans are weird in that they really were down on Kimbrell in October. He ended up getting the job done, you know, obviously on the edge of, on the edge of the seat there with barely being able to get the job done. And then becomes a free agent and everybody's clamoring for him to come back because the bullpen doesn't have enough de- enough depth. So I'm sure that Keiko was underappreciated while he was there. Now that he's a free agent, anybody has a bad start, there's going to be calls for Keiko to come back to Houston. Now we'll wrap up with this because I know uh, it's been a long day of travel for you. Just wanted to get your impressions. We talked a lot about the Astros, the series that was, and obviously we're going to be matching up here in a couple more days. But what were your impressions of three days of seeing the reigning world champion Boston Red Sox in person? I was impressed, obviously impressed with Porcello. Yep. I think Sale, what, what Sale did without his best stuff, I, I don't think he'd ever walked five guys as a Red Sox, period. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's probably some of the worst command he's had as a, as a member you, of the Red you didn't, you didn't watch him in April. That was, <laughs> that was better compared well, to April. Well, I, I think just the fact that he was able to get through five innings and, and hold this offense down, I think that, that was – that was impressive to me. And I think what the bullpen did that day too, I think we've, and you've talked about it a little bit here. They're, they're kind of doing a mishmash on this bullpen thing. Yep, uh, It's a bullpen by committee and they came in in relief of sale and, and really did yeoman's work um, on, on Sunday. I think Saturday was kind of an indictment on maybe when that doesn't go to plan. Um, mm-hmm. You look at Hector Velasquez and that, well, that's a, he, that's an Evaldi and price both being on the injured list. You know, that's, that's so, he's there and, and their number one, Number one depth starter Brian Johnson's also hurt, so he's he's kind of you know the uh, the last resort there, and he's actually been serviceable at least in his previous starts, but could not get more than one out, and and that basically was the game on Saturday. Yeah, and I think that kind of showcased what this Astros offense is that it's 
best. I mean, they were they were jumping first pitch. They were mm-hmm. working walks. They were. I mean, George Springer hit a triple off the off the center field wall in the first pitch of the game. Um, so, I, I think pitching wise, obviously, when they're healthy, they can rival the Astros as far as rotations go with with Eovaldi, with Price. Uh, you mentioned uh, when with, we saw Porcello on sale. I think offensively. I really like Michael Chavis. I think he's mm-hmm. a good ball player, man. Um, AJ Hinch talked on Friday. I actually asked him about Chavis and what he thought. He said, "We'll see if he can handle the heat." And then that Friday game, they threw him all fastballs, and man, he right. looked he looked really bad. And then <laughs> the next two days, he comes out and he hits a big home run off of Wade Miley that almost went onto the street over the mm-hmm. Green Monster. I think had a nice game Saturday too, if I recall correctly. But I really like him. Uh, yeah, I think another a, another big homer today in Toronto too. I think he's a. I think he's maybe a spark that. Uh, and I mean, just from watching from afar, it looked like that team in April needed some sort of life, needed some sort of energy and a spark. And when a rookie comes up and can do that and is just playing the game, you know, free and loose and playing like a little kid, you know, that that can help. And uh, I really like Chavis. I don't know if they're going to keep leading him off. I don't think he let off today, but nope. leading him off was a bold move by Alex Cora on on Sunday and trusting a rookie to lead off in a game where you're trying not to get swept and he, he provide and he delivered. Yeah. Um, I, I think obviously, you know, Mookie probably hasn't had the start to the season that he wanted. I think that'll obviously all, I, I think I'm always erring to the side of the law of averages when you come to these, to these good players, obviously Mookie's not probably had the start to the season he wanted, but mm-hmm. he'll come around and, you know, JD Martinez had some big at bats this weekend and, I think Andrew Benintendi has been struggling a little bit, but um, again, this is this is it's, it's kind of just the law of averages and how baseball goes. I think the Red Sox are really, really good. Uh, I think seeing how they and the Yankees and the Rays fight out for the East is going to be really interesting. It's going to be much more interesting than me watching the Astros pound on four sub five hundred teams <laughs> in the American League West. Yep, it is, and then obviously. The Red Sox are in the midst of a very tough stretch. Two series against the Astros. They have the Indians when they come back next week before going to the Bronx. So a lot of potential playoff previews. You can read all about it on the Astros side of things from Chandler Run with the Houston Chronicle. Thanks so much for joining us, and we will see you on Friday. All right. Thanks, Chris.